Hello, everyone. We're going to get started in just a minute. Hi everyone, for those just joining, we're going to give, we're going to get started in just a minute. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Nicole Barantes, and I am the Campaigns Assistant for World Animal Protection USO. We have a great webinar for you all today, How We're Ending Factory Farming, where we're going to look into our meat reduction and farming campaigns. Uh, this is actually our first time as an office doing a Zoom webinar. Uh, so myself and the other panelists are very excited to have you all on today. Uh, we're going to continue to give a few more minutes for people to join. Uh, in the meantime, we have a short activity for everyone. Uh, as we all know, COVID-19 has changed our lives. Uh, plans have been put on hold. I hope everyone here and your families are safe and healthy. Uh, that being said, I'm wondering about those plans on hold. Uh, who here is thinking about traveling? Uh, I have a fun poll that should pop up right about now. Uh, with the question, if you could travel right now, where would you go? If you don't see the poll option on your screen, please feel free to use the Q&A feature. Um, also, to make it easier, I put continents as your options or else that would have been a lot of countries on there. <laughs> uh, I see uh, results coming in, giving a few more moments for people to answer. I see two strong winners so far. Oh, this is looking good. Okay. Still have people um, putting in their answers. It's actually a good eight people that want to go to Antarctica. I think you eight people should go together. Um. <laughs> okay, great. Let me close the poll and let's see those results. So, uh, not a surprise, answer is Europe. So, majority and North America. Great. Well, I hope you guys all enjoyed that. Let me close the poll. Uh, thank you everyone for voting. Um, okay, let's get started. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here is our agenda for today. Uh, we will briefly go into our history as an organization, dive into our campaigns, and at the end we will have Q&A. Uh, please feel free to ask questions during the presentation using the Q&A feature. Um, now I'd like to introduce Liz Quick Corral. Uh, she is our Interim Executive Director, Director of Development, to say a few words for you all. 
Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Liz Quick Corral, and I'm the Interim Executive Director and Director of Development for World Animal Protection US. I just wanted to start off by thanking you all so much for joining us today to learn about how we're ending factory farming. Without supporters like you, we could not move the world to protect animals. However small the actions that you take, the action of all of us together creates lasting change that we want to see, which is exactly what we're up against when we're facing the issue of industrial or factory farming. Each year, about 70 billion animals are farmed for food, and the majority are done so in factory farms. This means that these animals are subjected to a life of cruelty and often captivity in tiny cages. They are routinely denied proper veterinary care and cannot embrace their natural instincts. Today, you will learn about how World Animal Protection is addressing this issue from some of our core employees who are working on this change. While the scale of this problem is quite large, I believe together that we can create the change we want to see. I will now turn it over back to Nicole, who will talk about the history of World Animal Protection and more about who we are as an organization. Great, thanks so much, Liz. Uh, for those unfamiliar with World Animal Protection, I'd like to give you all a special welcome. A uh, quick history about us. We are a global animal welfare nonprofit organization. Uh, we used to be known as WISPA, the World Society for the Protection of Animals until 2014. Uh, we've been active since 1950, from working on ending bear dancing in India to ending bullfighting in France and Spain. And our work focuses on animals in communities, disasters, the wild, and farming. Our mission is to move the world to protect animals. And our vision is a world where animals live free from suffering. Uh, so where are we? Uh, we are all over the world. Uh, we have offices in 14 countries. Our US office is based in New York City, but because of COVID-19, we're all safely working from home. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Cameron Harsh is our farming campaign manager and Joe Loria is our meat reduction campaign manager. Uh, both are a pleasure to work with and I'm excited for you all to meet them. Uh, first up is Cameron. Thank you, Nicole. And I just wanna reiter reiterate our thanks to everyone who's attending this webinar and giving us your time. As Nicole mentioned, I am the farming campaign manager for World Animal Protection here in the US. And so I lead and oversee all of our efforts to promote higher standards for animal welfare for animals living on farms and do this through corporate engagement, policy engagement, as well as public education and outreach. Next slide. The overall goal of our farm farming campaign is to improve the lives of all farmed animals globally and support the adoption of humane practices and minimal welfare standards across the industry. As Liz mentioned, there are billions of farmed animals raised each year, even here in the US alone. And these animals rely on our actions and actions by all of you to ensure that they have lives worth living. Next slide. Currently in the US, the vast majority of farmed animals are raised in factory farms, and some estimates have that over 95% of all farmed animals spend their lives in these factory farms. These are often referred to also as CAFOs, which stands for Concentrated Animal Feeding Operation. A CAFO is a farm that confines animals indoors for 45 consecutive days or longer and exceeds a certain number of animals living together in the same confined space. So the Environmental Protection Agency categorizes a large CAFO, for example, as one that houses more than 1,000 cows, more than 2,500 young pigs, more than 125,000 chickens raised for meat, or more than 55,000 turkeys. And there's actually several agencies in the US that oversee various aspects of their, the operation of CAFOs, and the EPA has oversight um, over partial aspects of CAFOs, because in addition to providing poor harmful conditions for the animals, these facilities emit and discharge enormous volumes of pollutants into our air, water, and soil. And they're legally allowed to discharge a certain level of waste per year based on their size. You can see in this photo of a factory farm in North Carolina, the manure lagoon with the pinkish uh, water that is where all of the pig waste is flushed to and held for long periods of time until it can be discharged into waterways or sprayed onto local crop fields. Next slide. Uh, 
Um, next slide, please. Yep, factory farms are characterized by severe crowding, barren living conditions, and extreme confinement. The animals are packed into these barns or into these feedlots with concrete flooring and poor lighting. Imagine spending your entire life in a crowded subway car at peak commuter times. Mother pigs and laying hens are even further confined, put into cages and crates to control their production and maximize the space of the barn. So jailing mother pigs in these gestation crates, as you see in this image here, confines them to a restricted amount of floor space so thousands of pigs can be packed into a single barn like sardines. It also allows for their feed intake to be severely restricted and regulated um, to monitor their productivity. Next slide. So this is a cruel practice that we're working very hard to end. And just launched last month, World Animal Protection released our first ever quit stalling report, which investigated 56 companies that have made prominent public commitments to end the use of gestation crates in their pork supply chain back in 2012 through 2015. Many of these companies set deadlines for themselves that have either passed or are quickly approaching. And our report found that only one third of companies appear to be making good on these commitments and providing regular updates to the public and to their customers. Another one third of companies no longer affirm their past commitments in their animal welfare statements or their corporate social responsibility reports, indicating that they were not actually making meaningful commitments when they were celebrated for them in the past. Next slide, please. Our report gave the companies a corresponding color code depending on the strength of their commitment and gestation crates, whether they're regularly reporting on progress, even if that progress has been very slow, and whether they have wishy-washy, ambiguous, meaningless language or have removed their commitments altogether. And we wanted to use this report to celebrate those companies that are persisting with what is a challenging commitment to fulfill by having these policies and public facing materials and continually reaffirming them with regular public updates, the companies continue to send an important signal, not just to their customers, but to the meat industry as well, that these cruel practices must change in order to continue doing business with them. Next slide. So already our outreach to the companies throughout this process has led to meaningful ongoing engagement with several major brands, including food service companies like Sodexo and Compass, packaged good brands like Campbell's and restaurants like Dunkin'. Uh, we have also heard from companies that have reaffirmed their commitments and made public updates online. If you want to support companies continuing to affirm their commitments or pressure companies that are lagging behind, you can read our report on our website at the link that Nicole will put into the chat. We will also continue producing this report each year to ramp up pressure on these companies and to keep ensuring that they're making progress over time. Next slide. A second aspect of our recent work that I would like to highlight is our engagement with major financial institutions that have substantial investments in meat companies. As we know, money can be a powerful motivator and we've been working with investors to better understand the financial risks that are systemic in low welfare meat and dairy supply chains Investors and investment groups over the past few years and even decades have started to quantify the global economic risks from harms like climate change, biodiversity and habitat loss, human rights and labor abuses, and public health outbreaks, all of which have direct connections to low welfare farming practices. So for World Farm Animal Day on October 2nd, we held a webinar in collaboration with the major investment firm Alliance Bernstein. And our webinar was attended by 30 other investment companies. And it was an opportunity for us to provide information to the investors on the many risks that I mentioned, as well as our initiatives of World Animal Protection to develop tools that better enable investors to assess the welfare risks of specific companies in their portfolios. Next slide. Lastly, World Animal Protection has become a global leader and expert on antibiotic resistance and the connection to factory farming. Due to the emphasis on rapid growth rates and the overcrowded bearing conditions in which the animals are forced to live, since the 1970s, the meat industry has given low doses of antibiotics to animals in their daily feed and water, as well as via injection at key stages of life. So now roughly 75% of all antibiotics sold in the US each year are going to the farm animal industry. And recent polling by, well, by us demonstrated that 85, 84 rather, percent of people in the US are unaware that the usage is this high. This routine reliance on antibiotics is contributing to the widespread development of bacteria resistant to those same medicines. 
Resistant bacteria, also called superbugs, are carried off farms in the animals and on the meat that are produced from them, as well as into the environment via the waste held in lagoons, on rodents and insects, through the ventilation systems, and on farm workers that take the superbugs back to their families. And 79% of people we surveyed are concerned about superbugs coming from farmed animals. When these bacteria reach people, they cause infections that do not respond to treatment and previously minor infections and surgeries are becoming increasingly life-threatening. It's estimated that 35,000 people die each year in the US from resistant infections. Conversely, research has also shown that reducing use in farmed animals is associated with as much as a 24% lower chance of resistance in humans. Next slide. So on the, to that end, World Animal Protection has been leading unique investigative work on superbugs. In 2019, we tested pork on retail shelves in the US and found bacteria resistant to critically important medicines present on the pork products, uh, indicating clearly that antibiotic resistance is an issue in the meat supply chain. This year, we've expanded on this work and collected samples of water and soil near factory farms in North Carolina. And these environmental samples will be tested for the presence of antibiotic resistance as well, potentially adding further evidence of the correlation between factory farming and harmful superbugs that reach humans. Um, with that, I'll hand it back to Nicole and just say thank you so much for listening. Uh, thanks so much, Cameron. I'll say before I started working at World Animal Protection, I never even heard of superbugs, so I'm glad this is an issue that we're working on. Um, next up is Joe Loria, our Meat Reduction Campaign Manager. Thank you so much, Nicole, Liz, Cameron, and of course, all of you at home joining us today. Uh, my name is Joe Loria, and I oversee World Animal Protection's Meat Reduction Campaign. Um, I work to educate the public on the importance of eating less meat, partnering with companies to increase uh, the availability of humane and sustainable proteins, and working to move governments to, on furthering meat reduction efforts. So Cameron just covered the many animal welfare issues associated with factory farming. And now I'd like to present to you all um, the solutions to combat it. Uh, so next slide, please. So high level campaign goals. Our goal is to reduce the consumption of factory farm meat to free up resources and move to higher welfare production. This means eliminating the use of cruel confinement, as Cameron, the ones Cameron just went over, the overuse of antibiotics, and the brutal mutilations farmed animals are subjected to. So, you know, obviously factory farming is horrible, and I'm sure you're wondering, how did we get here? Well, high demand for meat is what exactly created the modern day factory farm. And if we can lower demand, we can turn things around. And that's where my campaign comes in. It was decided to launch the campaign, this pilot campaign here in the US, because it's one of the countries that consumes the most meat. And the campaign has three key areas of work, or as I like to call them, our three pillars. The first is public awareness. So educating the public on the importance of meat reduction, excuse me, how to eat less meat and the humane and sustainable options currently available on the market. The second pillar is corporate outreach. We work with companies, big and small, to increase humane and sustainable options available, getting them to diversify their protein offerings. We've primarily focused in the past on quick service restaurants or fast food chains, again, both regional or national, and as well as some additional corporate engagement includes uh, meat reduction in the workplace. So getting companies to offer humane, sustainable options at their corporate cafeterias. Lastly, there's policy. So pushing for legislation on the national, state, and local levels that advance meat reduction efforts and increase humane, sustainable options for the public. Next slide, please. Uh, so factory farming is the single greatest source of animal cruelty. These facilities, I'm telling you, they don't look like the farms many of us grew up hearing stories about with green rolling hills or, or you know, mud where pigs can roll around in. Instead, they're often windowless sheds. Animals here are kept in extreme confinement, again, as Cameron mentioned, gestation crates, and they're denied natural behavior. The sad truth is these living, breathing, feeling animals often don't see the sun or feel its warmth until the day they're sent to slaughter. They've been commodified by an industry focused slow, uh, solely on trying to turn a profit and meeting consumers' demand for cheap meat. Next slide, please. So factory farming is obviously terrible for animals, but it's also terrible for the planet. Animal agriculture and livestock feed uh, pollutes waterways, and it's one of the leading causes of climate change. It's also a major source of deforestation and habitat loss for those of you who care deeply about wildlife. 
In fact, in the United States alone, over 260 million acres of forests have been cleared to make room for crop fields, the vast majority of which are used to exclusively grow livestock feed like corn and soy. Our current food pr uh, production system that's centered around animal-based proteins is simply unsustainable. Next slide, please. So it's bad for the planet, it's bad for animals. Factory farming is also bad for us. And meat consumption, whether it be considered processed or not, is likely to be harmful for our health when consumed in the large quantities that it currently is at. And meat consumption at the current level has been linked to increased risk of cancer, hypertension, diabetes, and an overall shorter lifespan. On the contrary, however, countless studies have shown that a diet rich in plant-based foods and high in fiber can greatly improve one's overall health. Next slide, please. <laughs> so let's just get this straight. World Animal Protection is not a vegan or vegetarian organization. We do not advocate for a vegan lifestyle or diet and have no plans to do so. Instead, we prefer to meet people where they are. We never take an all or nothing approach and believe we can make a huge impact on the lives of farmed animals if we simply reduce our meat consumption. Next slide, please. So again, we work with companies big or small to move the world for animals. And as part of our meat reduction campaign, we've worked closely with many food companies to push the envelope when it comes to plant-based innovation and bringing more meatless products to customers. By working with companies to diversify protein offerings, we can ensure customers have the ability to easily and affordably reduce their meat consumption. Below there are a few uh, companies we've worked with, and one example I'd like to point out is um, last year we worked with the UK-based sandwich chain, Pret, to increase uh, their plant-based offerings to include 14 new menu items, as well as two new non-dairy uh, alternatives that came at no additional cost to customers. And this came after multiple meetings with the company, as well as a positive influence style campaign, where supporters thanked Pret for being a leader in the space and urged the chain to increase their plant-based offerings. Next slide, please. This is really exciting because this is where it comes down to the individual level and making that impact for farmed animals. And so this past month, we launched Meeting Halfway. It's a 21-day journey guiding folks towards eating less meat. It includes support from yours truly and other meat reduction experts, our free meat reduction starter kit, loads of delicious plant-based recipes to make at home, as well as fun customized get-to-know-you exercises like quizzes and surveys, and special discounts from our corporate partners like Bistro, uh, a plant-based meal delivery service. Um, the starter kit includes dozens of recipes, as I said, uh, including a black bean breakfast tacos that are just delicious and green lentil dal, uh, as well as easy plant-based swaps so that you can make your family's favorite meals meatless. You sign up today at meetinghalfway.us and we hope you do so. Next slide, please. Cooking up a sustainable future. So in partnership with Forum for the Future, a UK-based environmental organization, we are reaching out to US culinary schools to incorporate more plant-based foods and sustainability into their curriculums. We believe it's critical to educate the next generation of chefs to be more animal friendly and learn how to master the art of making delicious meatless meals. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. Um, now it's time for our Q&A portion. Uh, please feel free to ask any remaining questions while we, while we do uh, this part of the webinar. Um, I see a question for, we have a couple questions for Joe uh, from Caitlin. Uh, does Burger King's implementation of the Impossible Burger seem like a step in the right direction and a sign of their willingness to change? It absolutely is. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a one for one swap, right? So if you choose to eat an impossible Whopper, it's one less um, regular Whopper being served. Um, additionally, it's really just the start of it. Uh, Burger King has since introduced other plant-based items to their menu and are continuing to innovate and offer more um, humane, sustainable options. So, you know, they're a real leader in the space and I absolutely see it as significant. Thanks, Joe. Um, here's a question for Karen, uh, for Cameron from Carol. Are you planning to address corporate farming subsidies? Subsidies. 
Yeah, thanks, Nicole. And thank you for that question, Carol. Absolutely. I think in order to really affect change in the factory farming space and the agriculture space, it really will be vital to address the subsidy system and all the subsidy monies that go towards large corporate farms and really prop up this factory farming system from a variety of different angles. That's through subsidies for commodity feed crops like corn and soy, um, as well as subsidies cities through disaster insurance and other crop protection programs. Um, it's, it's certainly a, a huge undertaking to take that on. We hope to do that in partnership with other organizations, but we absolutely intend to tackle this uh, subsidy issue. And that'll be very important as we get into the next few years and have another round of the United States Farm Bill discussions. Thanks, Cameron. Here's a question for Joe from Annette. Uh, can you discuss your policy work more with elected officials? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the pieces of legislation that we started on the federal level was the HEROES Act um, in the US Congress. And primarily because it supported um, you know, food assistance programs, especially during you know, the pandemic right now with things being incredibly difficult. Um, but the HEROES Act also called for increased funding for things like SNAP-Ed, that um, will allow for those in lower income communities and that rely on nutrition assistance to be able to purchase um, whole plant-based foods like fruits and vegetables. Um, another example that, of this is our Good Food um, Purchasing Program uh, Coalition in New York City, where we um, you know, work with the city of New York to implement meat reduction um, policy initiatives. Thanks, Joe. Um, and here's one more question for Cameron from Emily. Uh, what are the alternatives to gestation crates? Yeah, that's a great question, Emily. Uh, the, the alternative to gestation crates is to house sows together in groups in open space in the barn with enrichments. Um, so sows would be housed with plenty of space to kind of have her own space as well as space to get away from other sows when that's necessary but also have enrichments like straw and other bedding materials and other things that sows can interact with and manipulate and particularly ingest is, is what's best for them as well, so that they have outlets for their natural behaviors. They want to root around, they want to forage, they also want to socialize. Um, and there's, there's a great amount of research out there that raising sows in this way does help help with, with litter productivity and sow health and piglet health and well-being when they're born as well. Um, so there's a lot of great research showing that this trend that went towards the gestation crate high intensification system may not have been the best and encouraging industry to pivot towards these open uh, barn type systems. Thanks so much, Cameron. Uh, we're gonna put a pause there for Q&A. If your question didn't get answered, please, no worries. After the webinar, we will be sending a follow-up email and I strongly encourage you to add your questions there so we can answer it for you. Um, so before we say goodbye, the most important slide of the webinar, how you can help. Um, so after the webinar concludes, you will be directed to a short five minute Microsoft survey. Please let us know your thoughts uh, to help us improve future webinars. Um, please share the recording of this webinar with your friends and family so that they can get to know us and our programs too. Um, join Joe's Meeting Halfway program and start eating less meat. Uh, as Joe said, it's good for the environment, animals, and yourself. Um, you can also support the Farm System Reform Act, a pending legislation that would ban CAFOs. Uh, you can find out how to support by going on our website at worldanimalprotection.us. And last but not least, please consider giving a donation with the QR code on the screen. Uh, your donation will help us do our work better. Um, next slide, please. And that's it. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for coming. I personally had a blast speaking to all of you. Uh, stay tuned for our next event and uh, have a great day, everyone, and take care.